folks. Welcome to lecture 16. Lecture 16 is the first lecture in which we're moving on from the diversity part of the course to explore the social implications of plants. And we're going to start today by focusing on the history and origin of agriculture. In this lecture, we're going to explore agriculture's history and also think about what changes happen in the domestication of plants. As part of this, we'll look at some of the common food crops that we eat and think about not only their origins, but some of the controversies surrounding their origins. This sets up lecture 17, which is focused on California's agroecosystem. So stay tuned to learn some more about our state's most important crops. Remember, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. I'm happy to meet with you in a Zoom office hours. You did a fantastic job on midterm two. We're entering the last part of the quarter, and I look forward to finishing strong with you. Let's get started. Our last lecture was a review for midterm two, and our current lecture is focused on agriculture. After this, we're gonna focus on California's agroecosystem. Please make sure you check on Canvas so you can stay up to date with the latest lecture schedule. As an extension to our lectures on agriculture, we are going to watch this movie called Food Evolution. This is currently scheduled on May 21 and May 24. Now usually we watch this in class and it's a lot of fun, but unfortunately this quarter, given the remote instruction, you're going to need to watch it on your own. It's available in lots of different places. I see it on YouTube, I see it on iTunes, um, and I see it on Netflix, but you might have to pay to watch the movie. Um, if you look around on YouTube, oftentimes there are, are a few um, free links, so be a little persistent and you should be able to find it. But if this presents a financial hardship for you, please send me an email so we can make some different arrangements. So let's move on to apply all of the plant biology we've learned so far and start thinking about the aspects that affect plants and people. And one of the first really interesting and key ones, of course, is agriculture. So let's first think about the origins of agriculture. One of the first things that people think about when they think about the origins of agriculture is where it actually originated. And our best evidence suggest that it originated in this area that is known as the Fertile Crescent. This includes modern countries like Syria, Israel, Lebanon, Jordan, a little bit of Egypt, and Iraq. And so you can see on the map there on the far left, that's that area that's known as the Fertile Crescent. Now one thing I'll point out to you is that there's a big controversy, and the controversy surrounds whether or not agriculture evolved one time and then spread throughout human society, or it evolved multiple times independently. Now, the best evidence that I can find right now is leaning towards this idea that agriculture evolved multiple times independently about 12,000 years ago. You can see clear evidence of agriculture in paintings from Egypt as I'm showing you here on the right. And the article that I have linked below has some really good and interesting um, data that talks about the history of agriculture and how DNA is being used to explore that. Among the interesting parts in the origin of agriculture has been some recent work that points to this idea that agriculture may in fact be a lot older than 12,000 years old. And so there's some evidence in, uh, noted in this paper here that suggests that humans were hoarding seeds up to about 23,000 years ago. And there's even some stone tools that superficially resemble tools that would be used to do things like cut down wheat or barley. And so this, again, this is not uh, something that is 100% resolved, but it appears that agriculture is at least 12,000 years old. Given that we're a plant biology class and not really a history class, we're not gonna to focus too much on the origin and history of agriculture, but we are gonna start thinking about the major crop plants that we eat. And so one interesting question is where did these plants originate? 
And so one person, Nikolai Vavilov, has come up with this idea called the centers of origin. And so in his studies, what he did is identified key areas in the world from which the major food crops originated. You can see on this map here that he's identified nine or 10 areas which he thinks are really important and key to most of the staple food crops that we eat. Part of Vavilov's idea is that he hypothesized that the primary center of origin for a food crop was the geographic area in which that crop had the most living relatives or the highest diversity. So for example, if you wanna find out where tomatoes originate, you look for areas in the world which have the most living relatives of tomato. And when you find that, you, you, you think that that is where tomatoes originated. Let's move on from the origins of agriculture and start thinking about domestication. The first thing we need to do is distinguish cultivation from domestication. So early agriculture likely involved the cultivation of wild populations. So a good example of this might be collecting plants that you know are edible and planting them around where you live by transplanting them. Domestication is quite different. That's actually what you get when you have cultivation over long periods of time. And that results in some really dramatic changes to the plant, which we'll talk about in just a little bit. Early cultivation likely involved a couple of aspects. One is foraging or storing of seeds or even parts of plants so that you can then take those and then replant them to grow that plant back. And so seeds are obvious, but you might also use parts of plants that have meristems so that they can regrow that part. A good example of that might be a potato. Now another thing that could happen is habitat modification to favor the growth of plants that you want to eat. So a good example of this is still practiced today by Australian Aborigines where they go and they burn crops that are naturally occurring there in order to promote the growth of certain key um, plants that they like to eat. As we just mentioned, domestication actually results from continued cultivation. I like to think of domesticated plants as having a suite of characters that make the plant more suitable for human production and consumption. And I, I call this suite of characters a syndrome. So this is domestication syndrome. A good example of this would be tomato again. So if you think about wild tomato, that's what that looks like there on the far left. And it's small, it's bitter. Um, they have lots of little teeny seeds that are quickly dispersed. And oftentimes they're toxic. So you may not know this, but tomato is part of the nightshade family. And so at least when it's wild, it's toxic, a little bit bitter, and again, lots of little itty bitty seeds. When you compare this to domesticated varieties, what you usually see is gigantism of the edible parts. So in this case, we go from wild tomato, tomato to domesticated tomato, and we see that the tomatoes are nice and big, they have very few or no seeds, and they're non-toxic. So we've gone from small bitter to gigantism and um, not bitter, um, lots of little teeny seeds to few seeds or no seeds, and again, that toxicity is removed. One of the questions that frequently comes up when you start thinking about domesticated plants is ploidy. Remember that ploidy refers to the number of copies of chromosomes per cell. Now, whenever you have changes from a normal uh, number of ploidy, you have something that's called polyploidy. And polyploidy can happen in a couple of different ways. It can happen naturally, and there's some groups of animals that do this, and certainly many plants, but it can also happen as a result of hybridization. And so in the origin of many of the food um, crops that we eat, what has happened is people over many thousands of years have bred naturally occurring relatives to one another to try to 
drive certain traits that they want to see. For example, like larger fruit size. And so in plants, most of the polyploidy that you see in agriculture is the result of hybridization. Now don't get confused. Polyploidy does happen in nature and has happened as part of a plant's normal evolution. But in agricultural crops, this is usually the result of hybridization. And there are some consequences to this. Um, for example, although wild pineapples produce lots of seeds and they're hummingbird pollinated, the domesticated varieties don't typically produce seeds. And that means that all of the plants that are pineapples that you see are propagated artificially. And so what happens is clones are essentially made of pineapples in order to grow new pineapples. The same is also true of things like banana. So in thinking about things like pineapple and banana, one of the things we have to come back to is that syndrome of domestication, where instead of lots of little itty bitty seeds, you get few or no seeds. And so in the case of banana and pineapple, there's no seeds. And this is the result of this polyploidy that's due to hybridization. Another good example of this is something like seedless watermelon, where you have no seeds in the watermelon, and that's because it's the product of hybridization and is actually triploid. Let's move on to think about some really interesting historical examples so we can trace the origin of some key food crops. As we start thinking about the origins of some of these different food crops, one place that's interesting to visit is the International Center for Tropical Agriculture. What you'll find on this website is uh, some maps that are interactive that show not only where these crops are most diverse, but also diets of certain regions and primary areas of production. So for example, if we scroll down and have a look at the interactive map, one of the things you'll notice is that when I hover over a certain area, you'll see all of the different crops that are in active production in that area. And if you look closely, you'll see that some areas of the world have a lot more diversity in terms of their primary food crops than others. The first domesticated crop that we'll talk about is rice. And so clearly rice is an important staple crop for places all around the world. And the best evidence is that Rice is at a minimum about 8,000 years old. And that evidence largely comes from the Yangtze River area in China. But it's really not that easy of a story. So um, let's first think about um, rice uh, and its domestication syndrome. And that is that in wild rice, which is Oryza rufa pogon there on the far right, you have something called a shattering rachis. And what that means is that once the plant is flowered and you get the formation of those fruit, remember that um, rice have that special thing called caryopsis, those individual fruitlets get distributed very quickly. So they break apart very easy, but that's the rice that we want to eat, right? So. What we want to have happen is we want all those little fruitlets to stay attached so that we can harvest them and eat them. So in the wild rice on the far right, um, as soon as the little fruitlets are formed, they end up breaking apart and falling everywhere. Now the problem is, is that this species, which is well supported as the most recent common ancestor of all rice, has a really broad distribution in Asia. So all the way from China and India. And so what has happened is that India and China have both laid claim to the origin of rice. There's two major subspecies that are grown. One is Japonica and one is Indica. And so the differences are something you're probably very familiar with. Japonica is the short grain variety and indica is the long grain variety. Now, this actually comes back to this idea of the shattering and the non-shattering rachis. So uh, over the past several years, scientists have learned the genes that control this non-shattering rachis. And so one clue 
into when rice was domesticated is to explore where those genes arise. And what you find is that the non-shattering rachis likely originated in Japonica and then was moved via hybridization into Indica. And so it's likely that rice uh, sort of was domesticated in China, but then taken to India, and then also uh, that those genes for that non-shattering rachis were the product of hybridization between these two. Now, to complicate the story even further, rice in general seems to have also been domesticated at the same time in Africa. So it's likely that what we have is multiple independent domestications of rice, followed by a lot of trade and exchange and hybridization between all the different varieties. And so it could be that the story of rice is never completely uncovered, but right now the best evidence is that it originated in China. The next food crop we'll talk about also has an interesting history, and that is potatoes. Potatoes have a history of domestication that's at least 4,500 years ago and hypothesized to be as close as 10,000 years ago. Unfortunately, the potato doesn't lend itself well to preservation for that long of a period of time, and so scientists have to rely on other kinds of evidence to support this. Um, one thing that is interesting about potatoes is in contrast to something like rice where you have a few different subspecies that are domesticated in potatoes, you have over 5,000 varieties of potato. And so many, many, many different potatoes that have a very long history of domestication. Potatoes also form an important part of culture in Peru, and there's lots of great examples of art that prominently display potatoes that are actually a lot older than that 4,500 years date. And so this is some of the supporting evidence that supports close to a 10,000 year history of domestication. Either way, one of the really other interesting things about potatoes is that when they made their way to Europe in the 1700s, a lot of historians hypothesize that potatoes really ended famine in Europe. All of Europe really became highly focused on potatoes and potato consumption, which is one of the reasons why the Irish potato famine ended up being so bad. Tomatoes have a really interesting history, um, having likely originated in Peru, but were cultivated in Mexico about 2,500 years ago. Now, tomatoes belong to this group of plants called the nightshades, which we'll come back to when we start talking about plant poisons. But one of the interesting cultural things about tomatoes is that they were originally believed to be toxic, but the toxic quality of tomatoes is maybe not what you ex would expect. And that is that the toxic quality of tomatoes was believed to be aphrodisiac. So for more than 200 years, when tomatoes were introduced to Europe, they had kind of a bad rap. And so they were classified as something called a mandrake, which you might think of from something like Harry Potter, but mandrake actually means love apple. And so tomatoes were somewhat, somewhat feared and maligned because of their belief that they would inspire um, aphrodisiac qualities. Either way, tomatoes, um, are, of course, are used worldwide um, by lots of different cultures and actually define many different cultures' cuisines, but they likely originated in Peru. Onions have really uncertain origins, but the best evidence is in Central Asia. Now, one thing that is good about onions in terms of their history that we know is that the cultivation is at least 5,000 years ago in Egypt, and the evidence comes from two things. One is, is that many mummies were um, actually stuffed partly with onion. Um, onion was thought to be some kind of special herb, and so mummies were stuffed with onions. Ramses the four eyes were actually stuffed with onion. And of course, there's lots of art from Egypt that shows the eating of onions. The next plant we'll talk about is one of my favorites, and that's coffee. 
Um, coffee has actually somewhat mysterious origins, although it was likely cultivated first in Ethiopia. So there's lots of mythology surrounding the initial domestication of coffee, but there is good historical evidence that shows that Sufi monks were using coffee in the 1400s and that it then took off in the Ottoman Empire when there were actual coffee houses in the 1500s. Eventually, it made its way to Europe in the 1600s, where it was at least initially not met with very welcoming arms, but of course, much later on, uh, transcended all of its negative uh, stereotypes. And now here we are in a society which clearly um, imports thousands and thousands and thousands of tons of coffee every year and is a preferred beverage by college students everywhere. Since we'll spend a lot of time in Lecture 17 talking about almonds, including a visit to an almond ranch, I thought it would be important to think a little bit about their history. So almonds have a history of domestication that goes back at least 3,000 years and a history of cultivation that may go back 10,000 years. So this makes them among the earliest domesticated fruit trees. And what you find is if you look at almonds, the wild type of almonds, which is very bitter, and we'll talk more about that in a moment, grows widely in the Levant region and likely originated in Iran. So from Iran, this was traded extensively and almonds have undergone a lot of domestication pressure. Now, one of the interesting things about almonds is that there's a couple different varieties. The ones that we eat are the sweet variety. And the opposite of that, of course, is the bitter variety, which is a lot more like the wild type, as we learned about a little bit earlier in the lecture. Now, um, I put a link to this really interesting article which traces the history of understanding that bitterness. So it's important to know that that bitterness actually comes from compounds which, when combined, form cyanide. And so the bitterness is actually, you know, pretty toxic. Again, another one of those features of wild type um, plants. Now, there's a long history of uh, per people at Davis studying um, almonds, and um, this person, um, Meyer Hepner, um, did a whole bunch of experiments in the early 1900s um, in Davis, trying to actually control blooming a little bit in almonds to make them a little bit more productive and a little bit more hardy. And what um, he discovered, and which has been later confirmed, is that the bitterness is actually um, been dissipated in almonds because it's um, a product of heterozygosity. Now, if you don't have a genetic background, what this means is that um, the wild type almond had a double recessive allele, which produces the bitterness. Now, domestication, um, what the re result of that was is that the almonds now, the sweeter ones, are actually either heterozygous or homozygous, and most of them, in fact, are homozygous, which is another thing we'll talk about when we talk about California agroecosystem and a little bit of genetic engineering in coming lectures. Either way, this person at Davis discovered that one of the products or the results of domestication in almonds is this resultant um, loss of bitterness because of the dominant big B allele, which makes almonds sweet. The last plant we'll talk about is turmeric, and that's because in my opinion, it has a more interesting recent history than it does a historical one. Um, even though the historical one extends at least 4,000 years, as a herbal medicine in India. Um, interestingly, in the mid-90s, what you had is a couple of professors at the University of Mississippi who applied for and were given a patent on turmeric to treat flesh wounds. Now, these were um, Indian American scientists, so they, they came from India and clearly had a long cultural perspective on turmeric but uh, figured out that they could maybe apply for a patent. And um, because of 
the lack of knowledge by the US Patent Office were, were given this patent. And it took about 12 years for the patent to eventually be reversed because of vehement demands, of course, by Indian government and Indian scientists. And now uh, turmeric has somewhat got, had a resurgence and you can find it available in lots of places as a treatment for lots of different conditions, which we'll talk about when we come to medicinal plants. Let's finish by thinking about some of the problems that we're facing in agriculture. I really wanna use this slide to sort of think about uh, agriculture with a really broad perspective. And that is that our world population is greatly accelerating. And in my opinion, meeting that global food crisis for all those people is gonna require a lot of scientific innovation especially in plant biology. So eradicating extreme poverty and hunger is the top goal of the WHO. And so we're gonna spend uh, the next lecture talking about California agriculture, but then we're gonna move on to all kinds of biotechnology and watching that movie Food Evolution to get a little bit more perspective on how we're going to address the growing uh, world population with the tools of plant biology. In this lecture, we learned about the fundamentals of agriculture, its history and its origins. And in the next lecture, we're gonna focus specifically on California. Please make sure you're keeping up with the lectures and play pause it, and let me know if you have any questions. Thanks, and I'll see you next time.